<laughs> All right. So I'm not sure if anyone's going to be joining us tonight. <laughs> I'm here. Dave is here. So he already introduced himself. All done. <laughs> <laughs> so um, for uh, those of you who maybe have uh, joined us here and there for the month of May, thank you. This is our last session, live session, and um, I'm considering it a bonus because we've been doing it Monday through Friday, and this is Saturday that we're taping this. <laughs> so um, I did want to have Dave join me for uh, another one and uh, just give us a chance to share some things with you. And the topic that we're going to be talking about is your changed identity. And um, yeah, I was going to introduce this a little bit differently, but... <laughs> I'll just say he always has a way of changing my plans. <laughs> he me? always jumps me? in. Yeah, he always jumps in. He's the quiet one on the back, you know, the pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, but then he comes out behind the curtain. <laughs> so I've invited him to come out from behind the curtain. He's he does everything behind the scenes for Get GPS. So yeah. <laughs> I may tell him that while we're talking. Um, so uh, as you can tell, I'm pretty much the uh, face for GPS Hope. And I mean, which one would you want? <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> and um, he does everything, all the technical stuff, the driving of the Hope Mobile, and uh, the everything that you don't see is done by him. So anyway, um, I want us to start out tonight because uh, this is also going to be a replay on YouTube for people who don't watch it live. And it will just be out there. And so people who may have uh, stumbled on this video and not know our story would be interested in that. So <laughs> I'm, I'll go ahead and start us out. Um, and I'm going to do my best to keep it short because it, it's, uh, it's an interesting story and there's so many pieces to it. Uh, and if you do want to maybe read more about all this, more of the details and what I'm going to share, you can check that out on our website uh, for Becca's story. But when she, our daughter, oldest daughter was three, she was diagnosed with bone cancer. And so she actually, oops, I need that over there. <laughs> Man what, behind the curtain, would you go get my top? I started looking around. I was like, hey, are we missing something? <laughs> yes, we are missing something. Should I be sitting there? <laughs> yeah. Man behind the curtain, entertain. So um, Becca, our daughter, when she uh, she had her leg amputated because it was bone cancer, she went through nine months of chemotherapy, and uh, that kind of started the journey that we're on. And um, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to wait to show this. I have it now, but uh, <clears throat> my little prop here. At least it's next to me now. But uh, what they discovered was years down the road that one of the drugs that they were giving children at the time for chemo caused heart damage. So Becca was tested and she did have moderate heart damage. And so she, um, they kept an eye on her and it slowly escalated. And when she got married and was pregnant, uh, it, it uh, really escalated the heart issues and they gave her a 50-50 chance of surviving the labor and delivery. And she lived through that. And we were blessed to have a little tiny granddaughter at the time. And uh, so they both survived but it did, her heart issues continued and uh, she ended up needing to be on the heart transplant list. And they gave her a pump to run her heart during that time. And uh, through just a, a year and a half of just in and out of the hospital, more in than out, a good dozen ambulance rides, about uh, three medical helicopter emergency rides, uh, it ended up that her heart just finally gave out. And so our daughter passed on October 12, 2011. And that's what put us into this totally new world of grieving parents. And it, um, it did, it changed who I felt like I was. And, and you know, we're gonna be talking about our changed identity. And it's really strange because, I mean, Becca was the oldest of four children. So, and we had, uh, Becca had her daughter, we had another grandchild at the time. And, and I just, I, it just, it just changes who you feel like you are. It, it's, it changes everything, but it, it, 
that includes your your identity. And I, I remember wanting to introduce myself to people as, you know, hi, I'm Laura Deal and my daughter died. I, I mean, I just felt like Becca's death became my identity, but um, you didn't feel that way. I mean, we've talked and I've never heard you say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't quite so much like that for me. I mean, obviously at the beginning in all that fog, I have no idea what my identity was then, but. Um, well, at, I, really at that time, your identity was keeping the family yeah, together and trying to, I mean, your identity became protector was, and, and, you know, yeah. trying to just keep us all together and whatever you could do to. Yeah. The, I think, uh, I know my identity at work definitely changed, mm. not just initially, but long-term because, you know, the first few days back at work was obviously still kind of that numb time. Um, I was fortunate. Obviously, I had the three days of bereavement, but I was able to take a little bit more time with some vacation we had. I mean, isn't up, that but... terrible? Three days of bereavement when it's the death of your child. I know all of us have dealt with that, and some of you may have had yeah. more, but that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's, I mean, you, you need longer to adjust yeah. to your child being born than three days, and I think it, you need even more, more time to adjust to when your child dies than when they're born. So, yeah. The, uh, I, I think though, some of the things that it changed in me as far as work goes is number one, what it does to your mind in remembering things. And uh, we were just talking earlier today about things that you've told me that I don't really remember. <laughs> I mean, some of that is just my plain maleness or being a husband, <laughs> but it, it just definitely escalates. And, but the other thing was I was in the corporate world. Uh, I was an IT director and just being in meetings and hearing people get so emotional and upset about such little business issues. And it affected me to the point where I was having a hard time really relating that and supporting that part of a business when these things would come up. All I just I could, felt so petty. Yeah. It's like, you got to be kidding me. I just buried my daughter and, and you're complaining and all upset about this report didn't come out today or you know, whatever, whatever the issue was. And it, it was difficult for me to, to, to deal with the, the pettiness of, of all that. Um, obviously, um, once, once we were called to do this full time and sell our house and, and that has changed in, in identity in a sense that uh, at least our, what I expected us to be doing in, in life at this point, but it wasn't anything like the deep, deep darkness that you were going through at that time. And I remember even coming home from work, just wondering, <laughs> you know, and trying to keep my mind on work, knowing the difficulties you were having for months and months past all of that. Well, you were, you were talking about um, like the pettiness that just, uh, you know, that those are a lot of the things I guess that I feel like it's not just who we are as a parent or am I a parent <laughs> if, if maybe you've lost your only child or um, unfortunately multiple children, all of your children, not just that, but the identity of, of everything, uh, even, um, like right now with this COVID stuff, hearing from so many of you about the whole isolation issue. And, and it's interesting because some of you are telling me, um, I love this time of isolation because I don't have to make excuses to not go somewhere. We can't go anywhere. And this is great. I love it. I, I hope it never ends kind of a thing. And then there are other parents that the isolation is doing just the opposite where it's, it's very very difficult and it it's mm -hmm. triggering and not having being able to get to a support group not being able to get to a support group not being able <laughs> to just you know like 
like one mom writing to me that she had just started feeling like she was getting back into a rhythm of life again without her daughter figuring out how to how to start living again and then all of a sudden all this happened and it just put to a halt everything and yeah like the support group and and that kind of a thing and and just how difficult that was for her and so there there are so many parts of us that change and even like um I, I always, well, I, I was a uh, children's minister, international pastor, and I've done children's ministry, been a preschool teacher, and, you know, my life has been surrounded with kids. We have five kids, and um, and I, I love that part of my life, and obviously, children is high energy, and so I've always been a, a, a really high energy person, and <laughs> that... <laughs> That's probably an understatement, but because um, I, I thrived on it, I, I I thrived on things that needed high energy. And after Becca died, that has just I can't do what I used to do. I can't multifunction. I can't be around. I mean, it's been almost nine years, and I still struggle with being around in crowds of people and noise and and uh, and it's even hard, which is something I never foresaw was, I mean, I pictured our grandkids always over having fun, sleepovers, you know, all that kind of stuff. I just can't do that. I, I, I just, I, I don't have the energy for it. I don't have the bandwidth for it. And I feel horrible because that's not what I pictured for our lives at yeah. all. Just to be such a different person. One at a time for a while. You know, <laughs> if a they're life. old enough or if they're, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, have, I mean, I mean, my mom used to come now. and watch all five of our uh, kids exactly. for us. And it's like, it takes two of us to watch three. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, I, it's crazy. And it's hard because we want to be there for our kids too mm -hmm. you know and, and give them that chance for them to to do things and not be surrounded by the kids all the time but mm -hmm. it is it is difficult yeah so and it's physically there are so many physical changes it's it's and spiritually your your spiritual identity seems to change too and i i think it takes a while to remind yourself that my ch my being a parent, my being a mom, that's part of my identity, but it's not all of my identity. Mm -hmm. Being a wife isn't my full identity. And um, being a, a children's pastor when I was, was not my full identity. Those are all parts of who we are. That's part of our identity. And to, to get to the point where we remember really our full identity, all of that is wrapped up in the identity of being a child of God. Mm -hmm. And that part of our identity doesn't change. That part is sure and, and steadfast. That mm -hmm. is who we are. It's almost like an all-encompassing part of our identities, who we are, is we're a child of the Almighty God. And, no, and sometimes we don't like that identity because we're mad at God. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, even that is a struggle for a lot of parents. I know for me, I've definitely felt my walk with God much closer, especially with the Father. Um, and uh, with, you know, one of my favorite worship songs was that... Uh, you're a good, good father. That's who you are. And I'm loved by you. That's who I am. And that's the identity to really hang on to is that is who we are is we're, we're loved by, by our father, heavenly father. And um, that, that perspective has, I think, been brought much more closer to the surface after the death of Becca and our loved ones. And I, I mean, we really have to, a lot of parents really have to work through that. I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. hard, it's mm -hmm. tough. And that, that's one reason we do why we do what we do because we, we want to give parents a safe place to find that identity mm -hmm. and to find, um, 
to discover that he really is a good father, but to, to have a safe place to do that, right. to be angry at God and to be confused and, and all the emotions that come with it, you know, it, everybody around us, it seems like so many people want to fix us and they want to, they want to make us feel better. And they, they, they mean well, <laughs> but it's, if you haven't lost a child, you, you can't understand the depth of, of what it does to you and how it changes you as a person. I mean, people mm -hmm. talk about, I mean, just the other day I was talking to her mom and, and she was saying, so, people were asking hi, me, Vicky, I just saw, oh, <laughs> Vicky. <laughs> um, just the other day, I was talking to a mom, and you know, she said that people were asking her, "When are when are you going to get back to? When are you going to be your old self again? You know, yeah. when are you going to get back to normal? When are you going to?" Mm -hmm. And and um, it had only been a year. It's like, oh my goodness, that is just way too early to. I, I mean, Dave and I really like to make sure that parents know that anything under five years is considered fresh grief. Mm -hmm. for a parent who's lost a child so if you're struggling and it's also personal it's know, yeah the, it's the timeline so different the timeline is yes and we're all different and but if if you're still struggling and it's year three year four you're okay because it's the experts say this is still fresh for you and so for someone to be saying or asking you when are you going to let this go it's been a year it's been two years it's been four years when mm -hmm. are you going to get past this and get back to being you again it's not going to happen um our life is always divided into before and after. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember just the other day, someone, um, I ran into someone and his mom was with him and he was like, Oh Lord, do you remember my mom way back when we used to do this? And, and the whole thing was, that was when Becca was still here. Mm -hmm. It's like everything, the timeline is like before Becca and after Becca. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it's just, and I, I, I'm a different person now than I was then. And yet there are so many parents who are a lot further than we are on this journey. I mean, mm -hmm. we now have friends, I mean, around the nation that have been on this journey for 20, 30 years and more. And every single one of them that I have talked to on the topic of being a different person now every single one of them will say, I like myself better now. Every single one. And I found that fascinating to me because at the beginning, we feel so dark and ugly mm -hmm. and we don't want to be here anymore. And yeah, definitely if running across people that have been 10 years or younger, mm -hmm. there's been a few that are I don't like who I am now. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, yeah, and, because it's but, such a dark place and the yeah. anger and the bitterness and the, the pain and mm -hmm. it just, it takes over every part of your life. But when we keep going and, and we keep allowing ourselves to grow in this for our kids, I mean, it's, um, you know, we don't leave our kids behind and we keep living for them in, in a sense, because if we don't live for them and continue their life and their memory, who else is going to do it mm -hmm. for them? And so as, as we, and, and we get to the point where we embrace God's love and we embrace his comfort and we embrace his peace and we, and we begin to go to him. And instead of asking him, why, why did you allow this? Why did you do this? I mean, there are all kinds of questions that we can ask and, and we're not here to talk about the right and wrong questions or, or um, it, there's, you have to go to God with exactly how you feel and what you're at, what you're questioning him but the thing is we don't get the answer to the why and that can torment us if we keep going to God with the whys even if he did tell us <laughs> it's not gonna it's it's probably not gonna be a good enough answer for us I know like Dave said he's in IT and I am not a technical person at all <laughs> I mean, <laughs> about all I can do is reboot. Okay, reboot didn't work and I hand him and then it'll work just because I, all I have to do is take something towards him and it just snaps out of it. I mean, he's just that good. Uh, everything I have, <laughs> just I start heading towards him and they're like, oh, okay, I'll straighten up. So <laughs> it has happened more than once. I wish. I could <laughs> make a lot of money if that really were true. <laughs> 
it, it has happened more than once. But um, anyway, I, you know, if if I take him something and I want him to do something for me, and and he's told me I can't do that, and it's like why? And it's this look of frustration. It's like, I, do I really have to tell <laughs> you why? Because you're not going to understand it. Just trust me. It Believe won't. Me. And it's like, no, why? <laughs> I mean, if you can do this, if it can do this and that can this, that, why can't it do this? Why can't you make it do this? And he'll start telling me why. And it's just like, I don't get it. Never mind. <laughs> and um, okay, I believe you. So it's kind of like that with God. I think he he's so much bigger than us and he sees the big picture and he knows what we don't know and he sees what we don't see. And for him to give us an explanation of why it's either not going to be a good enough reason and we'll just keep arguing or it's beyond our understanding it's not going to make sense to us anyway and that's that's why god never answered job his whys mm -hmm. but the way he answered it wasn't a direct reason he answered him by saying this is who i am this mm -hmm. is who you need to know me as you need to change all the religious reasons, mm -hmm. uh, re religious views of who you think I am, this is who I am. Mm -hmm. And and that's why I think from an identi spiritual identity perspective, I'm so much better now than I was prior to that loss because of just allowing him to reveal himself to, mm -hmm. to me in, in such a yeah. more intense way. Yeah. And I, to, to get to the point where instead of asking why, you start asking how. How, God, are you going to get me out of this darkness? How are you going to make me want to live again? How are you going to uh, make good on some of these verses in the Bible that make no sense to me now that people keep throwing in my face? Like, um, he promises to work everything out for good. It's like, how can yeah. you possibly work something for good from the death of my child? I, I mean, you just can't see it. But when you start asking God, how are you going to do this? How are you going to work in my life? How are you going to reveal yourself? to me as a God who loves me after something like this, those are the questions that he's going to and answer. And I like how you bring up that, the scripture of just, you know, that he can, he's able to do more than you can ask or think and how. Can you say that a little bit louder, please? <laughs> I don't know. I, his voice gets quieter and quieter, so I'm not sure if you're hearing him. <laughs> well, when you're dealing with it, you talk about the scripture that says you're able to He's able to do more than we even ask or think. Mm -hmm. And how you said that, you know, especially early in grief, you know, we have people say things all the time to us of saying, well, that's really good that that's happened to you, but I don't see that ever happening to us. Well, that's a great place to be because that's where that scripture can truly be fulfilled. He's able to do what you aren't mm -hmm. even able to think mm -hmm. can happen. Yeah, I mean, we think, I mean, yeah, like you said, so many parents will say, well, fine, you you got to that place, but I don't, I, I never will. I don't see myself ever getting to that place where I'm out of the darkness and I, I want to live again, or I want to celebrate Christmas again, or whatever it is. And it's very true. I mean, that's so far beyond what we can think or imagine. And God comes in and says, that's what I want to do for you. I want to do more than you can even think or imagine right now. And I that just became a, an incredibly wonderful promise to me. I had never, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'd been taught that verse is more about, you know, you're asking for a, a this kind of a car, well, God's going to do above and beyond. He's going to give you this kind of a car. And, you know, you want this kind of a ministry. Well, he's going to give you this kind of a ministry. And, and that's how I have had that verse taught and used in my life. And so to see it, we always externalize all those things yeah, as opposed to what he's doing. With internal, us. internal to do so much more above and beyond what we can ask or think in our grief. I don't think I can ever get to that point. I don't think I can ever function again that I can ever want to live again that I do anything in life again I think the other thing that it has done is bring to a stark reality the the whole scriptures of where your treasure is so will your heart also be and our, there's nothing we treasure more than our our kids and our family and and now that we have that treasure in heaven it it's much easier for me to focus on mm -hmm. heaven yeah instead of everything that's going on around me here because 
you know, we have that deposit. We, we know mm -hmm. what's. Yeah, that's you know. true because another part of our identity, it, it becomes, I don't want to be here anymore. I want to be there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, and in a sense that, that becomes a changed identity that's actually a good thing i mean not in the sense that i don't want to be here and i can't function but i you know like i i've shared with people and i write in one of my books that i had I, it was i just almost a year to the day like a year and a week after becca had died and i was sharing with uh a friend of mine that I don't get to see very often. And, and I told her, you know, I said, Jana, I, just to be honest, I'm, I'm more excited about going to heaven. I mean, I feel guilty and bad, but I'm, I'm more excited about going to heaven to see Becca than I am Jesus. And she said, but Laura, you've, you've made a deposit there. And it was like, wow. And, and that was when I came home from there that God brought that verse to me that where your heart is your treasure will be and where your heart is your treasure is and and that just confirmed to me it was almost like god was saying it's okay it's okay i understand the pain and i understand the grief and i'm there with you i mean think about it he's inside of us he is inside of us so he knows the depth of our pain he knows the depth of our darkness he knows the depth of our grief and so even within knowing that it was like him saying it's it's okay that right now you're you're hurting i get it you're hurting to the point where you you want to see becca more than you do me and i'm okay with that I mean, because he knows the journey that we're on. I think it's also he's okay with that because that's one of the main reasons he died for us. It, of course, it was to spend eternity with him. But the main reason he gave his life was for us to be together forever, mm -hmm. not relationship. separate anymore. The, Everything the about him is relationship. With him and with each other. Yeah. And, I, and that's when our relationship here on earth is severed. It's very painful, but it's not, um, it's not a forever thing. It's, it's not a forever thing. And when you think about it, everything about God is about relationship. It's about restoring relationship, healing relationship. And so, um, yeah, like you said, what, what he did was made a way that our relationship is only temporarily separated. Mm -hmm. It's just temporary. And when we get back together, it'll be forever. And we won't have the sickness that separates us. We won't have sin and murder and all of those things that that separate us now from our children and those who we love. You had, um, <clears throat> I, I had gone through uh, something I had read or heard a, a statement about how God, God wraps blessings in trials. And when I read that shortly after Becca died or saw it or heard her or whatever it was, I, I wrote myself a note that I found later. And I wrote that down. And, um, and my response was, the death of a child is an awfully hard trial to wrap a blessing in. I mean, it just, it's, it seemed like such a terrible thought to me that, he, that God would wrap a blessing in the death of my daughter. And what I heard him tell me was, I know because my son died and it was wrapped in the blessing of you. And that just, wow, the, the thought of that, it really hit, hit me hard. And the, the thought of like, I, I didn't want to be here anymore. I, four other children, Dave, a ministry to children, international ministry that I loved. And yet I just, I didn't want to be here anymore. And even, even in my head, it didn't make sense. Cause I, I knew in my head, I have all these reasons to live, but I, I didn't, I didn't care if I lived or died. I begged mm -hmm. God to take me. And you and I have talked about that and God showed mm -hmm. you something about well, that it's because your heart was just like the good shepherd jesus leaving the 99 to be with the one that's the shepherd's heart you know the one that's missing and the mom's know, heart yeah especially the mom is yeah that, a parent's heart yeah is yeah if there's one hurting or one gone it's like our focus is on that one that's gone or hurting or you know something is going on and so, yeah, it's like you just want to leave and go find that one, <laughs> which which made a lot of sense to me. 
so if if the death of our child isn't what defines us then um i just want to maybe bring up a few things how how do we get to that place how did i get to the place where i didn't feel like i wanted to introduce myself hi i'm laura and my daughter died that that became my identity like it was at the beginning so what are some of these things where my daughter's death doesn't define me anymore and isn't my identity how did i get that back in in um in just that being who I felt like I was. Um, and I'm just gonna share maybe just a few things here that might help you. And um, because we're all different, it doesn't mean that these are gonna work for you, but at least here are some thoughts and you can continue praying about it and asking God if there's some other things that would work for you, maybe that aren't mentioned here. But one of them um, are were my thoughts. I had to start thinking differently and I had to have my perspective changed um, and I still do mm -hmm. um, you know something just for an example uh, a lot of you may have have heard me share this because it was so huge to me was um, the thought I would think about Becca being gone for like a year two years five years 10 years 20 years I it just I would start thinking about that and I couldn't imagine how can I possibly be here that long without her? I can't, I can't, I can't be here for 10 years without my daughter. I can't, I can't do that. And almost to the point where I would just have these almost panic. I was like, I couldn't breathe even. It just, it just brought such a terror on me to think that way. And so I did ask God to help me change my perspective on that. And um, one time I was in, well, I, I guess it was just in general, you know, Lord, you have to help me. And so one of those times I started thinking those thoughts and I heard the Lord speak to my heart and say, and tell me that, Laura, you're not getting further away from her. You're getting closer to her every day, every year that you are on this earth, you are closer to her, to seeing her again. And that just totally changed everything for me in that area because it's so true <laughs> it's so true I, I, I yeah i may be living this life and and we're almost um heading up to the nine year mark which i just back then i just i could not imagine what my life i how do you live life without your child and to to now be to that place where it's like that means i'm almost nine years closer to her now, i don't know how long that's going to be i think a, a barbara bush she had to wait 65 years to see her daughter again uh but even but if now it is for her it's probably a blink of an eye exactly yeah. <laughs> exactly once we're there i think the waiting that we did here is going to be like nothing it's going to feel like nothing like it was just a flash and um, so those are the kinds of things, changing your thoughts, changing how you think about something can really help in changing your identity. And even, you know, some of the things we've already shared, um, you know, our treasure being in heaven, that it's okay to feel that way. And, and um, I mean, there, there were so many things, especially in those early years, that God really did um, just totally changed my perspective and how I was thinking on something because how you think about something is how you're going to react and act. And, um, and so bring in all that fear and all that or changing the thoughts and asking God for the different perspective so we can have peace. I mean, that's huge. That's huge. Um, another thing that I did was um, finding things to be thankful for. And I know it's so hard when our child has died and it just really feels like, how can I possibly be thankful for anything? There is nothing that I can be thankful for. And I think sometimes that's part of what can keep us in that darkness and part of what can keep us into that, I'll say a false identity, um, because even though our child has died, that's an event that happened in our life, but it's not who we are. And we take that on as who we are, as part of our identity. And so finding things, even getting a journal and putting it by your bed and writing in it every night, finding two or three things that you could be thankful for through the day. Um, you know, I, I heard the birds singing today. I haven't, 
-hmm. I don't think I've heard them singing since my daughter died or, um, you know, I, someone, I smelled somebody frying bacon. <laughs> it smelled really good. I, you know, something that you can be thankful for something that, um, you know, I have my other children. I thank, you know, thank the Lord, thank, be thankful for whatever it is that um, I can finally get back into the doc. I can finally get my hair cut again, <laughs> something, but being thankful, it changes things in us. It changes us. And um, it just, it's a kind of like a stepping stone. And I think it really helps with that whole identity thing, because then our focus isn't on my child died, my child's not here anymore. We begin, it begins to open our eyes to see mm -hmm. that there is still good around us. And we can. Yeah, her, the event of her death, now that we're eight and a half years out, the event of her death it becomes more and more an event. Yeah, it becomes and, more of a moment in time and, than all consuming. And her, her life starts taking much bigger yes. part of our memories and, and what we do. And I, yeah, I, I think some of that is, um, it's not just time, but it's what we do with our time um, in, in working through the grief, mm -hmm. because that's, I, you know, I, I like that observation because it's very true. I think at the beginning it is so all consuming, but then as mm -hmm. you get away from that, the death becomes the event that it was. And we begin to see more of the life Mm -hmm. before that event and and that um that helps helps a lot <laughs> so but that's just something you have to walk through and yep. and get there in your that's own way in your own time different time frame for everyone mm -hmm. and something that i mentioned before was surrendering to god's comfort and peace i, I mm -hmm. mean it's 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 legitimate it's okay to be angry at mm -hmm. god to to you know question why this happened and and all of that but there comes a time where we get to make choices i mean we get to choose whether we're going to continue to see ourselves as the victim and and choose whether we're going to continue to blame god or are we going to just finally be worn out like a kid fighting his dad <laughs> and just get worn out and just say, I give up, God, I give up. I need your peace. I need your comfort. I need your hope. I need you to carry me on through this. And that can be in, happen several different times. Oh yeah. In cycles, <laughs> in cycles. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and another thing that I think is that can help, especially when we're struggling with our identity of, um, you know, my child died and that whole thing is to start living in a way that honors our child's life instead of being stuck in that one moment of time, their death. And um, as I say that, I, I don't, I mean, that, that grief and that darkness just comes over us and it is all consuming at the beginning. I mean, it just consumes you, but as we go along, there are opportunities to start walking out of that. And I think we don't feel like we are for a long time because it happens so slowly. We don't even recognize it. I mean, I think about the woman that talked to you in Ohio that, mm -hmm. um, what did well, she came up to the table and said i had mentioned to one person who was we were talking with her and uh and she was just being encouraged that you know as that it can get better for us and there's another lady that came and said it's been 15 years for me and it's, it hasn't gotten any better and i wasn't going to confront her on that but i i thought then you really have forgotten how dark and how horrible it was at the very beginning, because at the very beginning, you wouldn't have been able to even come to this event. Yeah. You wouldn't have like been able still to come be curled up, and, up in a ball yeah, in your you bed have been standing here in front of us at this table, even talking, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I think that's when we get to a point where we start identifying with the grief and grief and the death. And we've, 
we maybe get confronted with those choices that's time to make a choice and we don't want to make that choice mm -hmm. because it's, let's face it, it, there's, it there you come to that point where you have to you're confronted with am i going to continue to live in this darkness even though i don't know any way out yet mm -hmm. am i at least willing to start looking mm -hmm. and for some of us we answer no to that maybe several times before we finally answer for years, yes yeah and and it's because we connect that death and that pain with with our child mm -hmm. and if that's remembering goes, our child if that yeah. goes away then i've forgotten everything or know? i'm betraying my child yeah, or, or i'm death leaving them behind anymore. or mm -hmm. and it's, yeah it's that's really not what it's what it's about i mean that grief and that pain is definitely based on the depth of our love mm -hmm. but when that pain goes away it doesn't mean that love has stopped and it and it seems like to me there's always an undercurrent of that pain and that grief Absolutely. we just learn how to carry it we learn so that it's not debilitating to us um it's always with to, us to be able we to get, stop yeah we gain undertone. tools yeah to to be able to carry that grief and so it's 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 not going to be a pain-free mm -hmm. life um but there's no reason to continue to choose the pain thinking that that's what's going to keep you connected to your child right. um, because really for me i feel like that's a dishonoring to my child i feel like that would be dishonoring to becca if i wanted if i was choosing to live the rest of my life you, in darkness you may not have felt that way initially in initially <laughs> but right but but yeah. to get to the point where it's like i want to do something to honor becca's life i want to mm -hmm. do something that showed that her life mattered and 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 becca was so vibrant and full of energy and just full of life that I think if she knew that her death kept me in, imprisoned and in darkness and hating my life for the rest of my time here on earth, I think she would be very um, upset with me. <laughs> uh, you know, I think she would yeah, be like, yeah. mom, <laughs> snap out of it. Look where I am, <laughs> you know, snap out of it, do something, have fun with life like I did. You know, earlier you had mentioned surrendering to God's peace and rest. Mm -hmm. And because that it gets to a point where it, is, it becomes a choice um, that I'm, I'm going to surrender. And I once I saw somebody talk about surrender and they showed a picture of a hammock. It's like, what in the world does a hammock have anything to do with surrender? But they use that in a sense of you're surrendering, surrendering yourself to that, allowing that hammock to carry your weight so you can just relax, rest, and trust, and have peace. <laughs> and, and so I just got that picture of that, you know, God's trying to provide us a hammock of rest and peace. But sometimes hammocks, especially at the beginning, <laughs> you feel very nervous with them because you know, as I'm going to flip over or what, you know. Mm. But the more you relax and calm yourself, all of a sudden it is a very relaxing. I love hammocks. Yes, it does. <laughs> it's like but, its favorite yeah. place to be on yeah. earth is in a hammock yeah. and a breeze, yeah. ocean. With, with an ocean and palm tree. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah, if you fight against it, it can be very, very wearing. It can dump and, you out. And dump you out, yeah. <laughs> and give you a gash on your forehead. <laughs> like our granddaughter. <laughs> like a granddaughter <laughs> last weekend in our hammock. <laughs> so you that's because she was trying to get out. <laughs> that's because she was, yeah, fighting the hammock. So, yeah, yeah boy, that that's a good illustration, huh? <laughs> so, Just relax. Uh, yes and rest in in yeah in god's yeah, arms and, and you have yeah. to it's, it's giving up that struggle mm -hmm. in order to yeah and the last thing i just wanted to mention um that can really help with if we're struggling with the whole identity piece of things in our lives now is to connect with other parents who mm -hmm. who are on this journey um because boy i'll tell you i did not we didn't know anyone who lost a child so we didn't have any uh grief support groups for parents anything like that and and um i don't know if i would have gone at the beginning if i didn't known about it but i 
as God was leading us to, uh, he was bringing parents to us that had lost their children and asking for help. And it's like, I don't know. I, this just happened to me too. I don't know what I'm doing, but let's just walk this together. And, and, and we saw that it seemed like God was starting to birth a ministry through this. And, and I realized, well, if God's asking me to, to minister to other grieving parents, then I probably should let myself get ministered to, <laughs> um, and, um, be on the other end of this first. And so I did some digging and I found, a, a, a one day conference for bereaved moms. It was about four hours away. So I drove there and, and the thing was, I fought, I fought it for a long time because I thought I, I didn't want to be around a bunch of parents who were just going to be a mess like me. And I felt like we're just going to sit around and talk about our kids and cry about our kids being gone. And I'm going to leave feeling worse than when I went. And I didn't want that. And so when I went for that, that uh, weekend, I discovered how awesome and wonderful it was to be around a whole bunch of people who are a mess like me because we could laugh together you didn't have to feel guilty for laughing if the tears came you didn't have to explain you didn't have to run and hide um it was just it was it was awesome it was so wonderful to be around people who got it. it. You didn't have to explain anything. And you were just with people, you could just take off every mask and be who you were, even if you didn't know who that was, mm -hmm. it's, it was okay. And so I really encourage parents to connect with other parents, especially early on, um, find other parents who are further on this road than you, because if you can't see past the darkness, they especially, can be that light for you. Especially the ones that have made it past that darkness. Yeah, yeah, because sometimes you connect with other parents and they're in that darkness themselves, like this woman 15 years mm -hmm. out, and she was still, no, it's not any better. Um, and that's not mm -hmm. who you want to connect with. You want to connect with those who are back in the light, who have learned how to live um, with, you know, with that out their child and learn how to live a life of meaning and purpose again. And I don't want to forget this because I did leave for a minute to uh, get my little object lesson. And I think it kind of ties in right here. This is, let me see here. This is Becca's first prosthetic leg. So she was three years old when, <laughs> this whole mirror thing, there we go. <laughs> she was three years old when she had her leg amputated. Now this has a couple spacers in it. So it was actually even shorter than this when she first got it. But um, this was her first little prosthetic leg. You know how we save things from our kids when they're little? Well, I don't know why, but I just, I saved this. Look at those toes. I saved this um, from when she was three years old. And when she got her next leg, she'd get a new leg every year. And um, the I don't even think we've I don't remember that being saved until we came across it after. Oh, I knew I saved it. Away, but... I knew I saved it. Okay. <laughs> I, I yeah. That. Well, no, you wouldn't remember I saved it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, any oh, that was weird. I just it's got cute. a, I just got a whiff of this. <laughs> I there's a smell that comes with this, and <laughs> is it, it still boy, there? Really? It, it is. No, it isn't. You're yes, just, it you're is. Remembering okay, well, smell. I guess I'm remembering. But anyway, <laughs> um, I just got two S of it. But anyway, um, we we actually travel with this now because it's such a good illustration of when our child dies. It's like we have had a part of our being amputated from us. A part of our being has been cut off from us. And we have to figure out how to live with that part of us missing. And because Becca had this amputation at three years old, we had a front row seat to watching her learn how to live without a leg. And it, it looked mm -hmm. different than the other kids. There were some times that, you know, she was playing and you couldn't tell the difference, but there were plenty of times that it was obvious. I mean, she walked differently. She couldn't run and keep up. Um, there were all kinds of things that um, every single day she'd have to decide, is she putting her leg on right away in the morning? Is she going to go without it for a while and scoot around or hop around? I mean, it was, it was always there. It, it, there was nothing in her life that happened that wasn't a reminder, either consciously or, or subconsciously, that she only had one leg and that something had been taken from her. 
and, and yet and, she lived and she and, thrived and she and to begin with it was extremely painful yeah and, and excruciating painful and mm -hmm. trying to get used to all that yeah but yeah she did th thrive beyond it mm -hmm. it was a constant reminder every minute of every day right in her face all the mm -hmm. time i I'm, i don't have every part of me here mm -hmm. just like we are faced with that every moment of every day mm -hmm. But yeah, she's yeah. definitely a testament that you can, even though yeah. it's different, you can go on with a uh, an, an amazing a life, life. that thrives, <laughs> and it doesn't look like what we thought it was going mm -hmm. to. Um, but we can live a life of meaning and purpose. We can live a life. We can go beyond mm -hmm. just surviving. Oh, to one of thriving. her. One of the. She was. She was a worshiper. She led worship from a piano and uh, wrote worship songs. But one of the songs that uh, we can't hear without thinking of her, because anytime we did it, she was the one that did the verses to it. And that's I'm trading my sorrows and I'm saying, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, mm -hmm. Lord. Yes, yes, yes. Um, there was the verse. Yeah. How's that go? The um, press, I'm not pressed yeah, on. I'm pressed. Uh, blessed beyond the curses. Uh, I'd have to think of the song, but <laughs> it's been a few years yeah. since we've since we've sung it or heard it. Struck down, but not destroyed. Yeah. But, but she would always lead those verses because mm -hmm. it was so personalized to her and her overcoming those issues in her life. Now you got me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, come back to us. Yeah. Back to us. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I wanted to make sure that you saw our illustration that um, you can have a full life again and that your identity doesn't have to be that my child died, but your identity can be my child lived and his or her life mattered. And I'm going to live in a way that shows that the life of my child mattered. And it doesn't matter if like for us, we had Becca for 29 years. She lived 26 years beyond this amputation and her cancer. Uh, or if your child only lived for three or four years, or maybe your child didn't even have life outside of the womb, your child's life matters. Not just mattered, it still matters. Mm -hmm. It changes who you are, and um, and it doesn't have to be a bad thing. It it's it's horrible at first, and and it's hard, and it's a process that we have to work through. But um, but it you can be a different person, and your identity can be changed to something good because of your child's life. Um, before we kind of wrap this up, I want to just look, we had said hi to Vicki and Vicki says I can relate to those that say they don't like themselves now. And yeah, I mean, th th I think that's true of all of us at the beginning. Um, because yeah, we're so short tempered and, and we don't handle things well and I mean we just yeah <laughs> but um, it does get better Vicki I promise you. And uh, oh, Connie. I didn't get to read hers quick enough. <laughs> I did see Connie said she was still struggling about something, but I didn't get to read the whole thing. So um, so before we close this up, I do just want to share with, with you um, just about uh, where we are now, how we've gotten to where we are now. Uh, we do have in 2014, we kind of look back on it, trying to, we can't really put a date on it of um, GPS hope, grieving parents sharing hope, because it just happened really so gradually. Like I said, parents started coming to us. They'd heard we'd lost a child. Our church asked us, um, thought it would be a good idea to have, you know, like you have your little cell groups or home groups or life groups outside of the church. And so we decided, yeah, we'll put a group together and see if anyone wants to meet as, as um, bereaved parents. And it was kind of tacked on to the, the children's ministry that you were still doing at the time. So it's just another avenue of ministry until it became very clear that this was the new direction. 
Yeah, so, um, but that happened a little bit later. We started out with in our home and we had to come up with a name for this group. And so just praying it through, um, it just came to me. I believe it was God, GPS Hope, Grieving Parents Sharing Hope. And so that's what we called this little group. It was actually just one other couple that met with us. And so we met for a while and and then um, God just started he turned me into a writer and I started writing books and one literally fell into the lap of a publisher asked me what I was writing about when I met him and and ended up um, sending him what I had and he offered me a a contract to the book when tragedy strikes and wrote what six other books um, since then and um, it's just it's just grown almost on its own. And, and as those things started happening, um, I started doing some traveling for speaking and we started looking at, this looks like this is gonna be a long-term thing. It looks like that this is going to become our life um, that God is asking us to give ourselves to uh, offering support and resources to bereaved parents and especially Christians and believers whose faith has been shattered and who need a safe place, not someone who will fix them, but someone who will say, you be who you need to be in this grief. You take as long as you need to take, and we're going to be right here with you as you go through this, because we've traveled this same road and all of our journeys look different, but there are still things that are the same, the darkness, the suffocating darkness. There are a lot of things about it that um, we can all relate to. And so um, this is this is what we do. We're sitting in our motor home. We call this the Hope Mobile, and we sold our house and and uh, God provided this for us in a miraculous way, really. And so we travel the nation uh, for you, for bereaved parents, grieving parents who who need the hope that God has given us, and um, we just extend that hope to the people that God puts in our path. And so, um, anything to add to that? No, I don't think so. <laughs> so, if you want to find out more about GPS Hope, it's just real easy. Go to gpshope.org. You'll find our website there. Um, podcast, blog. We have a library, which has a lot of free downloadable things for you. Um, Obviously this YouTube channel, this YouTube <laughs> channel. So you can subscribe to it and get notifications. Um, after this month is over, I'll be back to putting out uh, something out every Friday. And um, we just do everything that we possibly can to reach out to you in a way that, that um, you can receive uh just to let us walk with you. That's really, that's really our heart is that we want to walk with you until you find your own hope and your own light and meaning and purpose and help you find that meaning and purpose again. Yeah, so you can become a grieving parent sharing hope to others. That's right. Yep. So that this can just continue. And uh, yeah, so and, and it's not in spite of your child's death, but it's because of his or her life. And you will always be the parent of your child. You will. That did not stop when your child left this earth. You are still their parent. You always will be. And um, when we think about it, uh, the fact that being a parent hasn't changed, it's just where my child is, is different. They have transferred somewhere else. I'm still Becca's mom. It's just she's somewhere else. And, um, and I'll be with her again. We'll be reunited. And um, all of this will be behind us. But until then, we're here to walk with you and do this together with you. So hope you check us out and uh, hope this was helpful to you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>